initial cohort for the ESLP book. Uh, in this in this meeting, we're going to cover the chapter about statistical learning. Uh, we are not really going to see any particular uh, models or algorithms yet, only a brief overview of what does a statistical learning mean and some of the basic concepts uh, that, that will prevail also as, uh, for the next chapters. Uh, well, this, these notes are a little bit different from the one in the in the book that was created for the ISLR cohort. So, well, let's begin. Uh, the, the main idea of a statistical learning is almost similar to um, machine learning or data science in a sense that from some data, we want to uncover information out of it, perhaps uncover some patterns. Uh, but compared to those areas in particular, uh, over here, there will be a greater emphasis in, in not only performing some really precise prediction, but also to get a little bit more of understanding about the actual model that we are using in the book. We don't really cover in full detail the theoretical part of the models, like the proofs and such. But we we do get enough theory like to understand them, but maybe not to implement a new one. Uh, some of the notation that we will be using is that for our data sets, uh, we are going to have some output variable. Well, in the case of supervised learning, uh, in general, in general, we will have some output variable. We can label it as a response or the dependent variable. However, I will I will just keep calling it response. And also some input variables. This would be like the, the columns in some table that we're using as predictors or features. Or well, we can also use the name independent variables, but to be really precise, uh, some there sometimes. They really aren't independent, so I will just stick to calling them predictors. So in the case of uh, making some model to predict a value, <coughs> sorry, uh, we are assuming that there is some relationship between the output variable and the input variables, and that it can it can be expressed via some mathematical function. Uh, however. As we can see over here, even if there is a, a type of relationship between input and output, uh, there is also going to be some random frequency or some error that we are going to be expressing with this epsilon or error term. And it's supposed to be independent from x and have mean zero. I think it, usually also it's really a, a normal variable, a, a standard normal variable. Um, and, and this is the main idea that we want to uncover some a uh, function that completely predicts the 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 behavior of the output. However, this function is perturbed via, via some error. And as we can see in the graphic, for example, from some inputs, in this case, this uh, this data plotted with red dots, we can assume uh, like a perfect or a, a well-defined relationship between those. In the case, that would be this line in blue. And the perturbances would be these uh, movements or discrepancies from the observed data, that is these dots in red, uh, and the curve, the, this theoretical a description that we have this curve in blue. So in essence, uh, the tools that we will be learning in the book are different ways to perform this estimation of to find this uh, supposed uh, relationship or function to perform predictions. 
So there are two main reasons, reasons why we would want to do such an estimate. And the first one is to make a prediction. <laughs> uh, well, this is most common, for example, in machine learning. Uh, perhaps in the case when we, you don't really, you're, you're not really bothered about the interpretability of your model. You only want to get a, a, a prediction that it is as precise as possible. Uh, in that sense, we're going to write a, this type of notation, this use of the hat symbol. In this case, let's see, it says f hat is going to be our estimate of f. Uh, and y hat is going to be our, our prediction of the output variable y of the response. So f hat would be treated as a black box in the sense that we don't know if, if no, we may possibly not know its exact form. Uh, and maybe we only care that this f hat function, it gives us precise enough predictions. Uh, however, in the book, these models, uh, well, they are not black boxes, maybe a little bit in the part about deep learning, but uh, for the algorithms or models that we see in the book, they, they do not exhibit this behavior. We do understand them. Um, also, there's an important caveat about how good can our estimations be, how precise can our predictions become. And that is, <coughs> sorry, and that is due to these two facts that there is, yes, a, a residual error in, in the fact that maybe our estimate of F is not perfect. However, it can be improved. So the error, this error can be reduced as, as its name implies perhaps by using a more appropriate uh, statistical learning technique. And um, however, there is also an irreducible error. And this is due to these random fluctuations that we had in the beginning because of this error term. And well, as, I, as we mentioned, these uh, random fluctuations, it's supposed to be independent from X and in that sense, it can be because, for example, it can represent some variables that we didn't take into account uh, at the time of construction or at the time of constructing our models. So maybe some variable that it did have an effect on the response. However, we don't know, we don't know the value of such variables, so we are simply uh, missing some important information, perhaps. And also, <laughs> they, they mentioned that uh, this epsilon term can represent some unmeasured, unmeasured variation. Uh, however, in the example that they give in the book, I didn't really understand the difference of this variation that they mentioned uh, and how it, how it differs from a type of unmeasured variable. Uh, and we can see also this type of errors that we get for our models, perhaps more formally in this sense that we have some response, some predicted value for that response using our model. So we can ask ourselves, well, what is the expected value of this discrepancy of the real response and the predicted one? So simply for, from the formula that we have over here, in this part, we can perform the calculation and it turns out to be these two terms. One is <coughs> a, a, the, the part of the reducible error, how would our model actually represents the true relationship between input and output. And this term, the, the variance of the error term or the error that it's also random variable. So something that it is out of our control. So that, that was one of the uh, objectives of why do we need to bother estimating it? And perhaps another one, if you are not so interested in prediction, that could be inference. Uh, and 
in, in this book, we understand inference. Uh, well, except for the last chapter, we, under, we understand inference in the in the sense of understanding how the variables uh, are uh, associated. For example, which of these predictors x1 up to xp, uh, which has a greater effect in the response? Uh, also, they mentioned, for example, if maybe one of them has a positive type of relationship, so a greater, sorry, an increase in that predictor also correlates to an increase in the response, and, or maybe it's a negative relationship. We can ask ourselves uh, those type of questions. And also in the sense that if, if the association between the inputs and the output, it, if it can be understood via a simple model like a linear equation, or is it actually something more complex? Uh, in, in this scenario, when we are working with inference, to, un to understand the association between input and output, we do need to know the exact form of our <coughs> of our estimate function. Uh, for example, oh, no, no, actually we are going to see an example very later on in the part of parametric methods. So, uh, yeah, only I I leave it at that. So, uh, we already saw why estimate this relationship. So now, how can we actually do it? Uh, it seems first that we have to settle on some type of notation. Let's see, n for the number of observations, x, y, j uh, for the value of the j predictor corresponding to the y observation. So again, like thinking of a, a data frame, some table. And we're, we're going to be working a lot with this term, this training data. And it's going to correspond to the set of observations that we are going to use in order to estimate this function. So our goal will be to find this function that approximates the actual value, the actual response for any of the observations that we have in our training data. Uh, uh, yeah. So, now that, we, now that we have our goal, uh, wait, wait, no, no. So we have our goal defined. So uh, now corresponding to the type of statistical methods or models that we are going to be learning, they can be characterized in two. These are parametric or non-parametric ones. Uh, we can start with the simple ones. These are the parametric ones. In this case, <coughs> sorry, we start via making an assumption of the form or the shape of f. So we can think, oh, maybe this function is linear. So something that could be expressed in this form and giving our p predictors. And now that we have selected a candidate for the form of f, now the the goal of estimating f is only a matter of estimating these parameters beta sub zero up to beta p. Now, in order to estimate it, we need to perform some fit. And in that sense, uh, there are really many ways to do it. However, the most popular seems to be that is simply the ordinary least squares. Uh, however, I think in the part, in the chapter about regularization and such, uh, they, they do mention that instead of using this type of metric for the fit, uh, in some context, it, does change, it, it is useful to consider other type of metrics or so other, other ways to, to measure distance between two objects. Um, it can be, for example, useful. I think it happened that if you used the L1 metric, so that is only considering the absolute difference between two elements, not the square difference, uh, that that type of fit 
uh, it helps uh, in the case that there may be many players in, the, in your data. So despite this being the most common one using the L2 method, the, the usual Euclidean one, uh, sometimes other type of metrics can be more appropriate to the problem in question. Um, okay. Okay, so that's the goal with parametric methods. Um, these methods tend to be not quite flexible in the sense that they do, <coughs> sorry, uh, they may not allow for a quite for a big diversity of type of functions. For example, if we limit ourselves to this, uh, we're only thinking of linear functions and we are already completely ignoring uh, maybe some quadratic term and such and such. So in that sense, we say that there is low flexibility. However, if as you increase the flexibility of your model, for example, we could do this over here if we allow for square terms for the x's. Uh, if we do that, uh, sometimes what can happen is a problem of overfitting the data. And that is that <clears throat> there is so much flexibility that something like maybe the course that you construct, it doesn't really match the expected relationship. So this course in blue, but it follows too closely these errors. So these discrepancies over here. And, and that is a problem because then when you try to use your model for other data sets, not only a training one, then you see that the predictions are really not quite accurate. So you lose generality of your model if in, in this type of scenario. Um, and the other method is a non-parametric one. Now, we do not perform any assumption about the form or shape of this function. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, so we do not make those type of assumptions. Uh, so we only look for another type of estimations. Uh, I don't think there are examples over here. Mm, no, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, but they do mention that because of this scenario, you you do typically use this type of methods when you do have a lot of data, so a big, a large number of observations compared to the parametric case. Ah, and these non-parametric methods do tend, tend to be more flexible, which can be also an issue, uh, and we will see why in, in later parts in, in this chapter. Okay. So now we are in the section about, let's see, the trade-off between prediction accuracy and model interpretability. And that is, uh, it's got to do also with what I mentioned in the beginning, uh, that perhaps in, in machine learning, they tend to be more interested in prediction accuracy, even if they can't really interpret the, mo interpret the model. Um, <coughs> well, that sort of, led to the problem that we have right now of a lot of black boxes being useful, but well, many people being scared uh, about their actual, about what they are actually doing. Uh, um, and um, a concrete case would be what well, is happening with deep learning and this type of models like, I don't know, uh, ChatGPT, those ones that can generate uh, images from text. Because we, well, they are also black boxes, so we don't really understand uh, what they are doing. So I don't know, it seems to scare the public uh, about the future of AI. Uh, however, in this book, we do learn about a lot, a lot about interpretable models. The models are really simple, actually. So, well, let's begin with this part. Mm. So as we saw for the models, they can be parametric or non-parametric. 
And it happened that the parametric models there, they usually have low flexibility. And, and it tends to happen that restrictive, or, or we can also say uh, less flexible models, they tend to be more interpretable. So they are useful for inference. For example, what we saw in this case for the linear form, we know that even with only the sign of these parameters, beta sub p, beta sub one and such, and we gain uh, knowledge about how the change in this variable affects the, the output. So in that sense, they are more interpretable. And also more flexible models can be difficult to interpret. And in that sense, they also increase the complexity of this estimate function. Oh, let's see, there is a comment. Uh, let's, I'm going to read it. Let's see, Lydia says, yeah, especially if the data and the algorithms are fed, don't properly represent the population they are trying to estimate. That's where you get in trouble with black boxes and big data. Yeah, that, that was also a point in, uh, well, in a class I had yesterday. They were talking about uh, when the class, well, the, the classes that you have in your data, they are not all, no, not represent, no, how do you say, evenly represented. Uh, there is a type of bias also in the, in the actual outcomes of the systems. And I, I remember the precise example that the teacher said yesterday, but he mentioned a case where that tended to, sorry, those type of models uh, build with classes that were not evenly represented. Uh, they tend to generate maybe some discriminatory tendencies uh, for minorities. <clears throat> I think that said, I think he said that in some model about if, yeah, about how likely some prisoner was going to commit a crime after he or she goes out of prison. I think that because of the data that they had used in the US to train one of those models, they had, uh, the, this model had an output that, that for most of the African-American people uh, in this scenario that, that were in prison are going and were going to to go out of prison. So for that type of for that type of case, the model said that most of them were going to commit crime again. And again, this can also be explained uh, with a problem in the data because they didn't have enough data for all of the population. So there were some bias also in that sense. So the model can produce incorrect conclusions if the data is not uh, accurately created. Mm, let's see. Uh, there is another example by Lydia. Let me read it. She says, another example is choosing job applicants. If you have more, mostly higher white males and the model is taught that certain characteristics specific to that sample is desirable, you continue to mostly hire white males. Yes. Okay, also thanks Lydia for that example. Uh, also about that part about even in the classes in your data, so that you eliminate this type of bias, uh, well, they don't really cover in the book, in this book, I think. But I think that uh, one usually does learn in perhaps more machine learning classes or, or books compared to this case of statistical learning. At least that has been my experience so far. Um, okay, we were over here. Uh, now, up to this part, uh, we have been dealing with the problem of prediction. However, uh, statistical learning does not limit itself to that. Uh, the algorithms that we are going to cover are actually divided into supervised and unsupervised learning. In the case of supervised, <coughs> as we said in the last meeting, 
sorry. Uh, we are going to perform a prediction. We have some model, it relates predictors and an output. And then from new observations, we predict what would their response be. And we also said in the first meeting, uh, for this other scenario of unsupervised learning, we don't have something to predict. There is no response variable. So in, in this case, we're going to work more in finding patterns in the data or, or performing clusters of it. Uh, they also mentioned another type of, for this type of models, and that is called semi-supervised learning problems, uh, but we're not going to cover it in the book, so I will just ignore it. Uh, now, these first two chapters, we're going to be learning about regression and classification models. So we only have to keep in mind that for regression, uh, it's a type of prediction, and what we want to predict is a quantitative variable, so a number, usually in a continuous sense. And in the case of classification, we're working with a categorical response. So uh, perhaps a, a finite set, uh, it does not have any order, and it's mostly comprised of labels. Um, and they do mention that also for this book, most of the algorithms, uh, they can work if, if your data has categorical or numerical values. Uh, and what usually is done for the categorical is what it is called, I think it is one hot encoding, or just simply creating dummy variables for them. So in that sense, the categorical case sometimes can be worked with in a quantita quantitative manner. Although it's not like one has to do that. Some models, they do work from the get-go with categorical variables, for example, decision trees. Um, <coughs> and an important part that I mentioned is that why do we learn a diverse set of models, or algorithms, or, or methods? And that is because there is not really a best one. There is not one that fits the model. And uh, it usually depends on the actual data, uh, what, which will be the appropriate model that you have, well, that you can use in order to get uh, quite accurate predictions. Uh, so it's that's because we're going to cover a lot of models. And now about the part of the quality of fit, I already mentioned that we are not limited to using these, this type of metric, the the usually Euclidean one. Uh, however, it's the most commonly used. And in the book, I think only except for the part about regularization, it's mostly MSE, uh, sorry, this mean squared error that we use for the fit. So it seems to be good enough for most cases. Now, mm, the performance of the method, sorry, the statistical learning method, uh, we're going to evaluate it uh, in the sense of how close are the predictions of the model uh, compared to the actual response to their actual observed values. Um, again, this, sorry, that notion of distance, we're going to use it with the basic Euclidean one, and we're going to denote it with the mean squared error. That is simply the average of these discrepancies. How can we interpret this value? Is that a small MSC means that the predicted and the two responses are very close. And if the MSC is quite large, well, there has to be uh, perhaps many cases where the prediction was pretty, pretty far from the actual response. Uh, and this part is important because we can make an, we have to make an important distinctions of from which data 
are we calculating this mean squared error? Are we do it, doing it from the testing data? That is some data that we did not use at the time of construct, constructing our model, or are we basing this error only from the data that we used for constructing that model, uh, that model estimation? Sorry, that function estimation. Uh, so in that sense, we make a difference between training MSE and testing MSE. Um, that's because we're going to we're going to model the accuracy. Sorry, we're going to make we're going to base the accuracy of our model uh, using unseen data, or as we are going to be calling it from now on, testing data. And not the data that was that was used for training the model. Uh, and it's pretty simple to see why. Uh, and we're going, to, yeah, I we say that in this example. Uh, yes, uh, last comment on, on this part is that it's not true that a model with the lowest training MSC, that is this number, calculated over the training data set. It's not true that the model with the lowest training MSE will also have the lowest test MSE. Um, I, I like this example in the book. They generate some random data, these dots over here. And <laughs> these are generated as random fluctuations uh, out of this line in black. So this line in black would correspond to the F function that we saw in the beginning, the, the ideal or two relationship within uh, about input and output. And these dots would correspond to the observations. And in particular over here, they, they would correspond to the training data. The testing data, well, it's not plotted, but it's not in the graph, but we will use it in this, sorry, they use it in this example in order to calculate this average with this testing data. Um, well, in this case, they also have the actual relationship is this particular course in black that they have defined. So this is the training data. Uh, and this part, they model two things. One is a training MSE, that is the curve over here, that is a Monoton monotonically decreasing. And this other curve is a test MSE that we see has a U shape. So it reaches a local, well, also global in this case, global minimum. Uh, and this line in this dashed line, I think it was the variance of the epsilon term that we saw in the beginning. Uh, and the an idea is this that for this two relationship in black and this observed data, this training data set, we can perform many type of estimations of these two, two relationship, this black curve. Um, for example, as we can see, they perform a basic regression. So we get this yellow line. They also perform what it is called a smoothing spline that I believe is something like fitting the curve by pieces using uh, a cubical polynomial. And those scenarios are what we can see, for example, in this green line, that it matches quite closely, quite closely these, uh, these dots. But as we can see, it matches these dots, these dots so closely that sometimes it differs from the actual relationship, from the actual black curve uh, and in that sense is that we map the flexibility and almost like the degree of the polynomials that we are using for this yellow line is um one a, a polynomial of degree one so yeah. in this case i think flexibility it has uh, value two because it's not exactly the the polyn the degree of the polynomial but it's almost like that. So for the yellow line, it has a value over here. 
of two as flexibility. And the, as the, for greater flexibility, we have, we allow for polynomials of higher order or also for smoothing splines of higher, how do we call it? Higher degrees of freedom. So as we saw in this case for the green curve, because there are more pieces for which you are constructing your cubical polynomial. So there are more pieces where you can actually see that there is a very close match for this for these dots, for this training data. Uh, and as we can see for the training data set, if you allow for a lot of flexibility, you can make that training MSC to be quite low because you could even, for example, if, if we go to the extreme case, we could even try to fit a perfect uh, curve for all of these points. That would be like the most flexibility that we have. And of course, in that scenario, the training MSC would be zero because we are going for, we are covering precisely every of the observations. Uh, but as we can see, if we get very, very close to zero for the training MSE, it also happens that the corresponding test MSE goes up. So that is a issue uh, that we mentioned be before about our fit in the data. So you you match some you match so close to the error of the data that your model can be properly sorry can not be properly generalized. And in this case, we see the trade-off between flexibility and MSC. Uh, that happens in this, at this case, I think it's for the value of five or six. And that is because despite the training MSC not being the lowest possible, we do get that the test MSC uh, achieves the local minimum or the global minimum that we expected sorry, that we wanted to get. So we do not have the lowest tra training MSC. However, this very small, almost the smallest possible value for the test MSC, it does say that uh, our model is being very precise and that it has worked very well also. Uh, so, I'm sorry, and that it can be also be generalized pretty well. So you can use another set of data and you can, sorry, another set of data different from the training one and that you can, uh, and you can trust the predictions if your model is performing. And that's what I mean by generalizing. Uh, ah, and, and they also mentioned that this type of behavior, this monotonical decrease of the training MSC and this U shape of the testing, sorry, of the test MSC, uh, it has happened to be the case for any data set and for any statistical learning method. So we're always looking for this minimum. And the author said, uh, as the model of flexibility increases, the training MSE will decrease. However, the test MSC not necessarily. Um, I already mentioned this. So now this concept, <coughs> sorry, this concept is also, from, now, how do you say? No, not completely. Very, very important. Uh, we will make we will be mentioning it almost almost always uh, for the rest of the book, and that is a bias variance trade-off. Uh, for this the for the definition, let's see. Uh, we consider some particular observation for the training, and we calculate the expected test MSC. That is simply this term. Um, what it corresponds to is the average test MSE that we would obtain if we were to estimate F using 
a large number of training sets. Each of, each of those, we would have tested at this specific observation. Uh, let me see what to mention over here. Uh, let's begin by this. Uh, they mentioned that it can be proved, although they do not cover it in the book. I think it's covered in the elements of a statistical learning book uh, that it can be it can be proved this expression that is that this expected uh, test msc equals this value as we saw this value is being always above the variance of the epsilon term because both these variants and this bias the well squared happen to be no negative numbers and this part is what they are mentioning about the variance by well bias variance trade off. Uh, I want to see if I put it over here. No, so it's over here. This part is term over here, the variance of the statistical learning method. It refers to uh, how would your estimate of F would change if, sorry, how much would the estimate of F would change if you fit different data as training data set? For example, in this case, uh, let's see. No, it's over here, sorry, I already passed it. In this case, for the yellow line, that is for the case of using a, a model of linear regression, the estimate is what? Well, it's this line. And um, how would it change if we change the training data? That is, what is the type of variance associated to this linear regression model? Well, we see is that, for example, for these dots, if we were to add another dot, maybe over here, almost yeah, at this edge, the line in yellow, it may well uh, be of not of this form over here but maybe it could go up a little bit. However, not much. So in that sense, the line generated is not changing much, even after having modified the training data. However, if we now consider this type of curves, this, uh, this green line, if we were to add, for example, a lot over here also in the edge, well, then we would see that in this part, corresponding to this new dot that we are adding, well, the, this curve would need to almost blow up up to here and then come back down in order to fit the data. So for this model of this green curve, uh, it would change a lot because it would be like this, like this, and then it would have, it would have a huge spike and then go down, even, of, even after only having added one point over here. So a small, uh, change in the training data uh, produced a big change in the estimate of F. So that is basically what we are talking about when we are discussing the variance of a training model. So for the, lin for the line, for the linear regression case, it has low variance. Um, for, the, for this case of this curve in green, that is the smoothing is playing, it's more flexible, so it has a it has higher variance. So as I mentioned, well, sorry, as it is mentioned over here, the more flexible a statistical method is, that is, the the greater possibility of functions that your statistical method allows for, then you expect also a higher variance for it. So this term would increase. Uh, and now lastly, for the part about the bias, this term that is being squared, let's see. <coughs> it says bias refers to the error generated by approximating a possibly complicated model. So that happens in real life by a much simpler one. So how different is a two relationship F and the estimate of F? Uh, that's what happened over here, right? 
there was a F in black that it seems to be almost, I don't know, a cubic polynomial or maybe quintic polynomial. Um, however, of our method of using a, a straight line that, that is just simple, simple linear regression, uh, there is quite a lot of error uh, from doing that assumption because the true F, that is this curve in black, differs a lot from this estimate F, that is this curve in yellow. So in that sense, the bias of this linear regression method uh, seems to be quite high for this specific case, because the actual F is, uh, well, seems to be a, a cubic or quintic polynomial. <laughs> And again, if your statistical method uh, happens to be more flexible, then it usually it's also the case that it has a lower bias because it allows for a closer approximation to the true shape of F, this true relationship that we want to estimate. And there is a comment. Let's see, Lydia says, I think what you were describing earlier is a high leverage point where you have a multiplier that pulls the regression closer to it and makes it not feed your data points as accurately because it's farther away from the others. And yes, I, I was I was uh, adding this specific point, this high leverage point that you mentioned, uh, only to propose an almost extreme example of, of how the yellow line could change. And it didn't change as much. However, for the other type of model, this small plane, this curving green, uh, it does change much more compared to the linear regression model. Not, not really using high leverage points. I only use that one to make the to make that did to make the distinction more more obvious, more easy to visualize. Um, and lastly, there is a part about approximating the test MSC. Um, we will cover it in the in we will cover that in the chapter about resampling. We will be using cross validation, and then cross validation will be using will be using it also in the following chapters many times. Uh, uh, and now, the book does mention a part about the classification uh, setting. Uh, we've, we've been mainly covering the regression part. Uh, however, I don't really see the point of covering the classification setting because there is a whole chapter for it. I think it's a third chapter. So, for example, what I mentioned, yeah, it's a fourth chapter. So, what I mentioned in this chapter about for example, uh, gay neighbors, it also covered in the lab. So it, it would be a little bit redundant to cover all of this part. So I will simply mention, well, what I left up to this. And that is that uh, the fit that we make, as we see over here, uh, well, we're uh, performing a difference between two numbers, that is the response and the prediction for this observation. But obviously we can do that in the case of classification because the response is supposed to be a label. It, it's not really, a, it doesn't have to be a number. It can be an arbitrary category. So in that sense, uh, the fit has to change and they defined, uh, let's see, a common approach for quantifying the accuracy of this estimate, so for fitting our model, <coughs> would be to consider this difference. That is the average of the number of times that the predicted label, the predicted category, is different from the actual one. So the, this could be defined also as the test error rate. And the good classifier would be the one for which this ter test error rate is that is as small as possible. And again, this 
this part and what follows it's already in we are going to be covered covering it in the classification part so i think we don't need to cover it today uh, that would be it from my end if there are any comments or questions <laughs> 